Hopefully you're joining me on the back of watching part one of its meteoric rise to fame and stardom. This version part two looks at all the ports, mods and boosts that have been released across console and PC alike across real hardware. So let's blow away more than just cobwebs and dive right in. Doom on PC was released in 1993, but that was merely the start. The following year, the two biggest ports for market attention were released for the then competing bit walls of the failed add-on to the Mega Drive or Genesis, the 32X, and Atari's last fling in the console space with its 64-bit <coughs> Jaguar. But this was the special one in many ways. The Jaguar was a project handled by Carmack himself after his incredible improved port that was head and shoulders above the PC release with Wolfenstein. Its superior res, colours and locked 30fps movement, okay 25 in Europe, even the sound was of a far higher quality and sample rate thanks to its 22kHz frequency. So obviously the same was expected of this version. But the boosts are obvious, as is one of the biggest sacrifices to the port, music or lack of. Now this came down to a very simple reason. The Jaguar had a DSP that could and was used for 3D calculations. Think the Super FX chip on the Super Nintendo or the SVP chip from Virtua Racing on the Mega Drive. The downside was, this also handled the sound processing for the Jaguar and as such, it did not have the capacity left to handle the collision detection of the game and other areas along with sound effects whilst running the game music sequencing. Thus, we get an ambient game here that does have a very different feel to the game over other versions. Now, This was something that Sega played on in its marketing the 32X version. Other cutbacks also came in the form of the lower 2 mega RAM the machine had simplifying levels and losing some others. Creature count dropped as did sprite frames to compensate for less RAM compared to the average 486 or 386 of the time. Along with the limited 4 meg cartridge which was another sacrifice that had to be made, which is why the levels are cut back and simplified. Bus limits and hardware design choices also played a part. Now, even though the textures were of a high quality bit depth, they were lower in size, which could affect the details on some parts. But elsewhere, the port was a huge boost over the PC in many ways and became the foundation for nearly every single conversion released after this point. Carmack rewrote large chunks of the code to maximize the CPU and wrist based chipset of the machine. The software rendering became a legacy that would hamstring other conversions later, mind. Now, although the Jag targets the low settings on PC, it's a little bit better than that, and the texture details are removed or changed in places, the colour is much better, specifically the depth in the shade. Due to the fact that 8 bits are dedicated to the luminance range, this gives 256 shades per colour, which enhanced the vibrancy of colours over the 256 of the PC and reduced the banding on the darker sections. The CRY colour format was not the obvious choice, but due to the machine's design from the ground up to shift Gurid shaded polygons around at a fair lick, this smooth gradient required a wider spectrum and luminance range. 8 bits was not going to cut it. This benefited many titles, including sprite based work, and Doom was yet another. The large screen defined sprites and relatively smooth movement, more on that later. It was an incredible port of this texture map 3D game for the system. It was delayed slightly so that Wolf could bask in its ported glory and be released, and it obviously was not a larger leap as that title from its PC origins due to the much higher requirements. But nothing vital was lost. The same sampled stereo sound that was introduced worked as well here, enabling you to locate enemies in the game from the growls and them you. The depth in shadows, varied creatures, moving floors were all present and correct, with it also running as well as many PCs of the time, just not quite at the top level. The nips and tucks were mostly cosmetic, aside one big change to the flow of the game. Split up into chapters and map locations no longer appears here, instead you work through the maps as one continuous flow towards the fiery end. It ran very well indeed, all things considered on the machine. Due to the machine being an old school raster based system and not a frame buffer, it splits the resolution up simply here by using 172x200 for the action sections and 345x40 for the taskbar at the bottom, but this still keeps the frame rate and performance high 
even though the 17 or 20 in the US FPS can dip below that occasionally in heavier sections. The doorstop of a controller also allowed it to be the only console version that could switch weapons by matching buttons just like the PC, thanks to the handy overlay that comes with the Jaguar titles. This was id bringing across the fully fledged Doom experience to console players and expanding the brand. It was a big game for Atari and although it was the first to be made, it was not the first out of the gate. That was bestowed on Sega America's life support device, the 32X, which again was based on the Jaguar port to risk-based systems, but the cutbacks came with less levels, 17 now rather than 22. Music was reinstated, but it's arguable whether that was a good thing or not. Relying on the Mega Drive sound chip, the 32X could have done a lot more with its DMA sound system, as the Yamaha FM chip was not as well suited to sound as the Jaguar, and samples, although possible, did not sound as clean due to the 8-bit limit and single channel output they had as a base. Many devs ignored this limit at times though. Yeah, it's it's pretty shocking, but it didn't have to be. Who remembers rocking out to this beast from Thunder Force? <laughs> Further downgrades came in the form of smaller screen, although an early prototype did show a build from the PC version with more textures and a bigger screen, but performance was affected. Colors were also down to 256. Due to the limitation of the 32X, which is better than the standard Genesis or Mega Drive that it operates on, but it's not quite as good as the Jaguar port here, looking much flatter and more pixelated in many areas. Even more cutbacks came here though with less levels, the same lower enemy count and only having forward facing sprites now removed all possibility of enemy on enemy action. All these things did not resolve the other issue though, performance was reduced. Sega needed to sell its new 32 bit machine and on paper the 32X was more powerful than many machines that hosted ports of the game, including the Jaguar itself and its competition, the Super Nintendo, but performance really didn't stand out on this title again and was worse than the Jaguar port we'd already seen, or at least at this point we're about to see. That said, it was close and it was a rushed port and it still performed much better than many PCs of the time. No, Wolfenstein released on Nintendo's 16-bit machine, it was a watered-down version of that game which was impressive considering it ran on the base 6502 CPU, something which Doom could never do. So the fully-fledged Super FX Chip 2 was used to bring this horror classic to the machine, but maybe it should have stayed away. As at this point on the SNES, it is the worst version of the title we have seen nearly in all areas being the first one not to use the Doom engine itself, instead a reality engine coded by Randy Linden cut back on the floor and ceiling textures. Monsters could still only face you and could no longer hear you from raycasts and sounds, likely a CPU resource saving. The game renders at a standard 256 by 288 here in the UK or Europe, but to save on processing, the pixel width is halved. But you can also see that geometry is missing in certain parts of the map, allowing you to walk through areas that previously were walled off likely another sacrifice to keep performance as high as possible. The lack of texture mapping on the floor really affects the visual appeal of the title as well, losing the glow and the movement of water so it just looks like a green floor, which leaves the whole game looking a little flatter than other versions overall. Super FX in tow does little to solve the blocky graphics, grainy colour, terrible depth of scenes and worse still, frame rate. Sound is the best thus far though, with sampled music files being clean and mixed with decent sound effects, a small bonus I guess, but a bonus nonetheless. 
It is a chore to play though, as the digital controls make strafing much harder even over the other console versions. It is helped very much by the corner buttons, the shoulder buttons on the controller itself, but the frame rate is incredibly slow and juddery, which makes all of this horrible because the single digit frame rate it runs at is certainly one of, if not the worst games I have ever tested here. Added in a few enemies and you can see the frame times into 200 milliseconds often. Being the first one on the list here that wasn't ported from the Atari Jaguar base, it restores some of the map layout and the construction from the original PC version as this was a brand new port. The FX chip was a co-processor so literally it was another CPU but the problem was that it would hog the bus so the CPU itself couldn't operate at the same time or without clever tricks splitting off memory allocation to give you a scratch pad to work in. And all this equals more cutbacks. Pathfinding, for example, in the game is terrible. Characters will regularly stand around looking like an extra from Riverdance waiting to be shot. And the shotgun just sprays everywhere, hitting people randomly in an area is more than enough. Another change is also come, even the texture quality is cut back. You can see here for an example, the hanging body cut in half, which is on many other versions, although not all of them, is missing here completely on the Super Nintendo. Although some of this may have come again from the crazy family friendly feel they went for. Overall the visual quality is lower than the lowest setting on PC. So far as getting this running on the SNES it is an incredible achievement but the lacking CPU grunt and core element of the title this is one version that maybe should have stayed in development hell. The same year that Nintendo saw its 16-bit release and before 3DO limped over the line with its own, Sony secured a version for its first entry into the console space. If any questions remained on which would deliver the best version between the two 32-bit machines, it was answered a year before. This is how a port should be handled. GT Interactive handled the port and id helped manage the process to keep it as close to the original as possible. And this meant utilising the CPU to render the engine as much as possible. Although not in its entirety, it did grant them the rights to utilise the hardware of the PS1 much better than later ports. And this meant that affine texture warping was an issue which was common with all the 3D machines of this generation. I covered this on my Wipeout videos. Now this is basically the primitives are drawn with 3 verts which exacerbates the issue. Although there were other options. The machine could also render a rectangle which mirrored the quads that the Sega Saturn used for polygon creation. Now this is the mode within the GPU instruction set that allowed them to create a 4 point polygon polygon or rectangle. Now even though it was still created from two triangles back to back, now this reduced the warping on the textures due to how they are aligned but it is slower than the normal 3 point verts by a factor of around 2 due to the doubling up of the verts. Check that video out for a more detailed description of it. This still leaves the PS1 having similar looking issues to all other games with warping or be them greatly reduced and more in line with what the Saturn delivers but it allowed the developers at least to utilise the strengths of the machine and remove the load from the CPU alone. Movement on the controller is very good for a digital game, but again, like others, the strafing is confined to the shoulder buttons, which is easier than the hold and D-pad methods of the JAG 32X, but not quite mouse and keyboard smooth, or better still, analogue sticks. Visually, the same pixelated scaling and limited animations remain even if they are boosted over previous versions. They are not quite as vast as the DOS-based original. They can now fight and hit each other and we see side animations when they move. Level construction is still limited to a similar layout as the Atari base it is ported from. Although the reinstated levels from the PC port are the full constructed ones just like Doom 2. What really sets the PS1 version apart though is the use of coloured lighting everywhere and the additional lighting effects that are present in the title which embellishes this version with stronger hues in rooms, a clearer divide between shadow and light that only enhances the atmosphere further and it really looked impressive at the time, even bettering the PC version. Remember this was two years after that released and this wouldn't have been possible without utilising the hardware benefits of the PS1.
The Aubrey Hodges soundtrack aside, which is of course brilliant and as everyone knows, the sound effects themselves are pretty close to the original Atari version and they stand up very well, the Atari version, even now due to the DSP that powered it. Obviously the PS1 is a little bit basier and there's more variation and effects applied to them, but overall the sound effects are very good and enhanced, but they don't wipe the floor with the Atari versions as much as the additional visual benefits and performance boost that it offers. But it does dip slightly more often at points, but never as far as the 3DO or Super Nintendo versions. It makes the game much more fun to play as you can control move and aim far easier due to the consistency improvements in the title and the visual boosts it offers. Super Nintendo did enjoy a better soundtrack than the 32X version, and obviously better than the Jaguars, but all versions paled to the power of the 3DO. Well, maybe inside the PS1 version, but still it's one of the highlights of the version, that's for sure, and there's a reason why. Using a band to recreate the music for each level and simply playback from the CD was a masterstroke, but it, like everything else here, was a solution to a problem and this port had many more than others combined. It was in fact a development hell all of its own. Now the short version here is R Interactive was the creation of a misguided entrepreneur Randy Scott and his short pitch on a Japanese TV show sums up the lack of probably planning this guy had, let alone a clue. He sold the Doom game before he even had a game to sell. It sold him the rights for a port and then he scrambled around to bring that over to the machine, under the basic rule that all good tycoons use. 1. Buy Doom license. 3. Profit. This obviously did not end well, but he saw a silver lining by using the talents of Rebecca Bill Heinemann that had ported across Wolfenstein in short time. That was an incredible port. Again, the use of CD sound was a boom to that version also. Misled into working on the project thinking it had been started already and only required bug fixes and optimizing to the hardware, something that she specializes in. This was not the case at all. August 1996 was when the actual port was started, taking the Atari code yet again as the basis due to it already being reduced to fit into the smaller memory with its 64x64 textures and its wrist based code. 10 weeks to shoehorn the entire game into the cell process of the 3DO. Although much of the engine is again powered by the 12.5 MHz CPU, Rebecca did use the graphics hardware to at least draw parts of the game, the walls. The floors and the ceilings still came from a software solution though due to the lack of perspective correction in the hardware for texture mapping. The port, music aside, is horrible on all levels. Even the secret full screen cheat code designed for the later but never released M2 hardware cannot save what is a choppy mess to play. The highlight of the port is its CD soundtrack. Not having the time to write a music streaming system from RAM, it was much easier to use the 3DO player to stream from the audio from the disc. A simple fix, and one which was the only boost this version can claim. Long stutters can happen due to the seat process on this mind, which gives you a hard to control and play Doom port that loses all the smoothness and finesse that the title is famous for. 60 FPS streams are long gone. Instead, 10 FPS would be a boost. Reducing the screen size to its smallest setting does help marginally to keep the average above the 12 level, but generally if you put it in the size that you can play, then it hovers around the 10 to 12 level FPS when you're in action. It can hit some highs of around 15 and even 20 FPS if you stick your nose against the wall, but this is very rare and completely pointless. It doesn't perform better than the Super Nintendo version, but I do mark it higher than that simply because at least you can see what you're doing and visually it is very, very close to the other versions. If, unfortunately, it trades the clarity of the Atari Jaguar version for the performance of a dead snail. Sadly, this isn't a highlight of the port, and it is the one that you should avoid for every single reason under the sun. And joins a list of titles that could have hosted a better version than what we finally got shipped. This version is a curio at best now, but the soundtrack is always something I like to return to.
Sega had to wait a little longer to see yet another version for its own true 32-bit machine in 1997, and with the 32X version setting the bar, we should expect an even better version. That's sadly not the case. Screen size and resolution are improved, but here ends the benefit. Visually, it is sharper than the PS1 version and has a cleaner aesthetic overall, but the same pixel look is evident across the title and like the PS1, the textures do not suffer from warping common with these machines and lack of perspective correction in the hardware. The reason? John Carmack's insistence at the time to keep the game's CPU-driven software rendering on Saturn. Much to Spectrum legend Jim Bagley's frustration as he had created a method using the VDPs of the machine to handle the workload and play to the strengths of the machine. What could have been possibly the best 32-bit version by far, owing to the unique strengths of the Saturn hardware itself, was instead nearly the worst due to it being hamstrung to its SH2 CPUs to keep VDP1 fed with frames. VDP2 is only used for the distant background visible at certain points, so basically this is little more than a 32x version with a slight increase to upclock. Now we get all the limits of the Saturn here with none of the benefits. Mesh mode on all objects such as windows or spectres in the transparent mode, which at least does return. But the clean RGB feed demonstrates just how poor this looks to the PS1's transparency. In addition, all the sprites in the game, which could have been smoothly scaled rotated with a wider palette, are instead also drawn by VDP1 as the CPU is calculating the world. The dynamic lighting is called from this PS1 port, as is the frame rate, now even lower than the 32X version and worse than the Jaguar. A crying shame of a port that really demonstrates, as well as any other game on the system, that the Saturn was not that simple to develop for, but also, many titles did not use the system anywhere near to its full potential. For example, Probe's excellent Alien trilogy released around the same time was powered by a single SH2 due to the shared bus and IRQ issues the system had, but performance, quality, movement is a significant boost over Doom as it uses the strength of the hardware much better. Nobotomy Software's slave driver engine are the pinnacle of how to use the hardware best by exploiting the machine's benefits to create results that are as good if not better than the competition at times and that does include coloured lighting. Saturn Doom, like the 3DO port, was not an accurate reflection of the hardware or even the talents of the programmers involved. Instead, it is the result of outside influences, one which Carmack himself has now regretted but I'm sure not as much as the team involved in developing the title and fans of the machine at the time that were looking forward to possibly the best quality Doom thus far. And instead we got a version that was shackled to developers' intentions of keeping the visual quality as high instead of delivering the best quality version overall. One more version came for Ninty, and it was a ground up brand new title that shared little from all the previous versions. The Doom engine was significantly enhanced to support hardware acceleration that coincided with the OpenGL support on PC. The levels and entire layout of the game was also brand new, mixing up a split of textured polygons and sprites in a fashion that the Saturn version should have followed. It is the most consistent version here, a locked 25 FPS in tested sections. It is really smooth and fluid game beating the PS1 on that score. Feel and fluidity is improved further by the analog stick control, as it feels far more modern to play in combat, exploration and puzzles that are the same mixture of ways to open doors, backtracking maze construction with minor platform dashing of the older titles. Now visually it does share a lot with the GL version on PC owing to the hardware based texture filtering which smooths over sprites and textures as they draw closer at the cost of blurriness which makes them stand out from the background at least, almost like a retro depth of field of yesterday 
year. The coloured lighting, enhanced shadow system, recreated sprites, animations and all round improved visuals are only let down by the 320x288 resolution and therefore the typical soft look of many titles on the console due to the filtering and low texture cache. Unlike the pinnacle of multiplayer and FPS console action in GoldenEye, which launched only a few months earlier here in Europe, this game at least ran with the frame rate and did not look like a photo album. The same fiendish level design which it had the team hold back on an early release to redo many of these, unforgiving difficulty, even larger swarm of demon spawn and dual chainsaws, what is not to love? It was a breath of fresh air at the time as fatigue had started to set in. The team were working on a multiplayer only Doom game based on the old engine, but the Quake impact had already taken the shine off the original engine, so this sequel set after Doom 2 was aiming to be a bit more of that full 3D look. Although it's not quite at Quake levels, even on this very machine itself, but that is a video for another day. It was a significant improvement on the base game and sadly was overlooked by many at the time with Goldeneye and even Turek taking the wind out of its sails in all ways. A lack of any multiplayer was not enough to stop it being not only one of the best console versions of Doom but also an exclusive for Nintendo. But this is no longer the case, as the devoted modding community managed to whip up a PC version of Doom 64X that takes the base N64 ROM and runs within a source port. It offers up all the charm, depth and beauty of the console version, but boosted with high resolution options, faster frame rates and a much cleaner display, meaning you can enjoy this largely miscannon tale on your PC with your very own remaster, but no reselling or HD tags are required. It is a treat to play even now, and with mouse and keyboard. It is as fluid as ever. Nintendo benefited hugely from the Doom craze. The Super Nintendo port came at the end of the machine's life, but its more powerful handheld release in the Game Boy Advance managed a version that looked, ran and played much better without the need for any extra chips. Static or dynamic lighting was now also in, with it having a small effect on the frame rate, but giving a darker look overall. The quality on a small screen is much better than the one blown up here but it still looks and plays better than the SNES release and still has the great music and sound present. The performance target of a near 20 FPS is allowed through it not running any V-Sync at all. So it will tear happily across the screen in play, but owing to the small screen you normally play this on, it is much harder to spot than it is here under my analysis tool. Like many other games here, you can see I have had to extend my frame time range into the 200 millisecond mark. For anyone complaining about modern frame rates though, you do not know the half of it. This was still based on the Atari Jaguar port and certainly on the level construction it is identical to that version, but it performs, looks and is much better than many of the versions we've covered here. Maybe not quite up to the Atari Jaguar version, but for a handheld, it's mightily impressive indeed. <laughs> Microsoft cashed in on the Doom craze when it launched its Windows 95 release and its first foray into the console space would not feel complete without a version of Doom to show it off. It came packed in with a special edition of Doom 3, a retelling of the first game but pushing technology forward yet again with its stencil shadow system, normal maps and much more. Wrapped up within this pack was Doom 1 and 2, just like we saw in the Saturn and PlayStation releases. But unlike those, this was a boosted DOS version, running over 30 FPS with extra texture details, all the effects and animation restored. This was the definitive version of Doom. A large reason is the dual analog stitch, which makes circle strafing simplicity in itself. Transparency effects are in, and all monsters return, as do the levels and construction of them. After each level, you get to see your progression marked on the map. Modern consoles saw ports of this version as well, such as the Xbox 360 and PS3 versions. In fact, you can still play this game as a download on your Xbox One, but the improvements there are very minor. The 360 version here just demonstrates the benefits from the increased resolution and the restored frame rate of the half refresh of 70Hz of old CRTs. It is as smooth and enjoyable as the base mode and wraps up my complete look at all the major titles of Doom across many hardware platforms and generations. 
So after a long and gruelling 11 individual version test, which one sits atop the best port then? Well overall it's pretty clear, the Xbox 360 or PS3 versions are as close to the DOS version as you can get. That was always going to be the case. The Xbox itself is the machine that achieved the closest version of the DOS release, sharper visuals, the smoothest performance even over most PCs that run it at the time, but this was 8 years after the original. In the mixture of 16, 32 and 64 bit machines though, the PS1 is clearly the best in all areas, delivering a refined experience of Doom that equaled or bettered the PC original at a quarter of the price. So is that still the best way to play the classic FPS Vanguard now? But of course not, not even close. The best place to play it now is where it all started, PC. Once id released the source code into the freeware domain, then the mods came thick and fast. And brutal. Now you can play many mods and entirely new games using a collection of source ports with the most widely known ZDoom landing early after this point. It still only supported a software renderer but allowed custom maps, enemies and full games. Now you'll be looking for the hardware accelerated version in these days and GZ Doom that support OpenGL to enhance almost every facet of the title. You can also dip into QZ Doom that offers up an early look into new features and there are other versions out there if you want to dip into more source ports. Once your chosen engine is picked, then the internet is your oyster to choose from. A simply gigantic collection of games, levels, tests and more that are fully free and almost always worth a try. Now Brutal Doom gets all the love and attention, which in many ways is deserved. The enhancements, changes, rampant and simply acid trip induced action it offers up is not so much tongue in cheek as through it and out the other side and into the spleen of the next guy. Heads explode, limbs fly, guts are spilled and claret is left across all surfaces, even assassinations are in. These are all still delivered within the same sprites over 3D world we grew up with, but into this crazy overdrive era. With such a frantic level of action across the original maps, all the extra ones on offer, you simply pick the WAD file to use and play them over it as you want in the mode you want. As enemies and swarms are increased, so is your arsenal. Dual machine guns, grenades and your much smoother boomstick are a treat to play and deliver a fun alternative to the original. Now many have said this is how Doom would have been or is the true base could they have done it and I strongly disagree. I think this is extreme fun and even though I always love playing it, laughing at its zany style mass giblet particles, it never holds me as long as the original Doom levels. This is not something that Romero and crew would have made but that does not distract from one of the best mods from the engine and a great way to enjoy some modern Doom action. Much of this mod though was built upon another, one that attempted to capture the authenticity of the game but improve and polish every part so you can see your face in it. Particle effects are now added, bloom lighting, improved texture quality and filtering. Every sprite, movement and enemy is now enriched with a far greater set of animation frames. Reloads never look so smooth, soldiers walk and die with fluid and much smoother movement but it loses nothing of the original appeal and instead is just what a lovingly created remaster would feel like. Better sounds, more animation, smoke effects, lighting changes, extra details, it really is an incredible mod that was created back in 2008 and still gets much less love than it deserves. Brutal Doom is great, but without the beauty here it would most likely not even exist at all or at least would not resemble what we have now. Even the choice of standard or enhanced weapons comes from this mod. If you get the chance to experience Doom for the first time, this is where I recommend you start. If the thought of a software renderer and pixel look turns you off, and if so I really don't understand why, then this is a fine mod and is the best way by far over all the versions we've just talked about to experience Doom right now for the first or for the thousandth time. But it does not stop here though, the GZ Doom base enables you to dive into other tales that take the engine further than intended and these stretch far beyond the Doom universe, from Lara Croft adventures to Sonic ones. The modular construction of Carmack's engine means that dropping the WAD files or the more modern PK3 files into a directory and firing up your source, you can sample many delights that the community has created and while months away playing or even creating your very own maps or more as you wish. A Doom map editor makes this a simple process even for those who would not know a char string from a guitar string. 
there were far more that I could possibly cover here. Many ports, many updates, many mods, even the Commodore 64 and Commodore VIC-20 have seen ports of this game running on hardware that has no business even running the title screen of this game, let alone the 3D visuals you get on screen, but they are there. The fact a title and engine created at the dawn of 3D gaming is still being enjoyed, modded, ported and delivering treats some 24 years later speaks volumes of just how far ahead of the competition this small team of three were and how the legacy they still leave endures. And if you did enjoy this or anything else that I've put together, you can always like and subscribe and also share where appropriate, which helps me immensely and leaving all your comments and thoughts and feedback below. You can also follow me on Twitter and ask me questions directly there. And if you really want to help a brother out, you can also support me on Patreon, but it's all entirely up to you as always. Strafe well, shoot first, and I'll catch you on the next one.